became a routine sight during 1960. 27 times, roughly once every two weeks, the skids creased the desert floor. 27 drops from 41 tries chalked up an unparalleled research plane record. At the beginning of the year, the X-15 was new, almost untried. At the year's end, it was proven, a record holder, discovering more about hypersonic speeds and extreme altitudes. January saw the number one airplane make its final qualifying flight. Delivery to the Air Force and NASA started a new crew on acceptance check and pre-flight readying. Joe Walker, chief research pilot of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, was the first to show that the X-15 is not a one-man airplane. At this time, two X-15s were flight ready. Number one was involved in the Air Force NASA program to take the airplane with its present engines and push it to the limit of its abilities. And Joe Walker's first flight denotes the start of this research phase. The number two plane was still being flown by North American for investigation of stability, control, flying qualities. routine, the landing uneventful. Two weeks later, another new face appeared. Major Bob White climbed the ladder to the cockpit to try his hand at rocket plane flying. An hour and a half later, the X-15 Pilots Club had another new member. The Air Force's project pilot had made his initial run and now was ready to start some serious research flying. The spring of the year saw a flurry of activity with two X-15s flying and North American racking up nine drops with the number two airplane. The Air Force and NASA alternated pilots on a separate series of nine research expeditions, flights that kept inching up on the world's speed and altitude records. Both company and governmental pilots kept investigating the flight abilities of the planes in different quarters feeling out the new machines, steadily pushing the operating area out farther, gaining confidence. All flying during this period was done with the XLR-11, the small engine package. Its thrust of 16,000 pounds was adequate for early investigations, but everyone was waiting for the big engine. The XLR-99, a brute that would blast out nearly 60,000 pounds of thrust to drive the plane to peak speeds and altitudes. This engine is installed in the third and last plane of the series, which has always been slated to be the test bed for this new power plant. And Crossfield uses his time in between flights to ring out the installation. Preliminaries are out of the way, and this run will be one of the final before flight. This 
long-awaited engine can be throttled, having an idle output of 30,000 pounds, but able to be regulated between idle and 60,000 pounds of thrust. Today's runs are the climax of a long series of tests proving the installation. After this start, they're ready for flight. second years of planning, months of test and grinding work went up in smoke. There was only one real observer, one eyewitness, the pilot, Scott Crossfield. Scott, what was your immediate reaction? Well, it was the biggest bang that I'd ever heard. Fortunately for me in the airplane, the explosion blew the forward section, the tanks and the cockpit out of the blaze or out of the major part of the blaze. And the firemen were right on their toes, and they moved in to blanket the tanks and the fire area with foam. The first reaction we had was that the engine had blown up. But like many first impressions, this was wrong. As soon as the parts cooled down, a disenchanted group of engineers moved in. And as you might imagine, things were pretty well scattered about. We also took a close look at the film that you've just seen, and here are a couple of frames that gave us our first clue. Just before the blow-up, a cloud of vapor appeared ahead of the engine. So the search was concentrated on this area. Following up this lead, we found that the hydrogen peroxide tank had been rammed, smashed open. But with what? Lining up with the tank is the center structure of the ammonia tank, and its shape matched the impacted area of the hydrogen peroxide sphere. But how could this part fail? Likely through overpressure. Now, a check of the instrumentation showed tank pressures far over normal. Again, the question, why? The pressure regulator was recovered and checked. It was determined that freezing caused by the very low temperature pressurizing gas had caused the regulator to stick full open. But there's a safety, a valve to relieve overpressure. This valve and the entire relief system was also checked. Here it was determined that a flow-sensitive relief valve combined with a vapor disposal equipment had created enough back pressure to fail the tank. So, a frozen regulator, a Foley relief valve, and a high back pressure relief system had gotten together and we had wrecked an airplane. The entire pressurizing and release systems were analyzed, redesigned, tested, and retested. We ran the combination time after time, deliberately creating the most severe failures possible. Weeks passed before we and everyone else were convinced that the problem was licked. As a measure of how the confidence was restored, here is what happened on the 4th of August. On this historic date, Joe Walker let out a yip of joy. He had just pushed the modified small engine airplane to a new speed record, then made his report to the public. Joe, how does it feel to be the fastest living human? I don't know if I feel much different than I did yesterday, except that the waiting for the flight is over, finally. did you reach your maximum speed? Uh, if you noticed the vapor trail from the engine, at the instant it cut off, that was the point at which I reached the maximum speed. Now, what was your altitude then? Around 66,000. 
how long were you going that 2,150 miles? Just one instant. Then on the 12th of August, just eight days later, Major Bob White was up before the cameras after his 136,500 foot record-breaking altitude flight. The flight today offered, uh, I would say, no problems and nothing that could be considered a limitation as far as man's ability to fly an aircraft. Right on the track. Your angle looks good, Bob. You're going up. Pass nine. Once I pitched up and reached the highest climb angle, I was very definitely impressed that I was going, well, almost straight up. Of course, it wasn't straight up, but it, it appears to be that way from the cockpit. Got you coming up on 10 now. Okay. Angle's very good. Going through 11 now. Burn out. Burn out now at coming 12 now. At 12, 6. And 13. Very sensitive. That's still good. Fantastic up here. What you see at this altitude impressed me as being the most dramatic point of flying at uh, over 130,000 feet. The very dark blue sky and the lighter band that was immediately surrounding the Earth, and then, of course, the many, many miles off in the distance that you're able to see. It's looking to the future. I would say that we hope very much, and I would particularly like to continue on in, in work that would take us to a higher altitudes with manned aircraft. Now the full potential of the airplane with the small engines had been fully investigated. While the number two airplane was being fitted with the big engine, number one began a series of training flights. The full crew was now given a chance to try its hand at piloting the research plane. Commander Peterson, the Navy's representative, was the fourth man to ride the X-15. He made two flights in early fall. Then Jack McKay, NASA research pilot, took his first ride at the end of October. Captain Rushworth, the Air Force backup pilot, was next to show his skill at rocket plane flying. NASA pilot Neil Armstrong's last two flights closed the year. Training flights filled the gap while the number two was being given a complete checkout with the large engine. Since that ill-fated day in June when the explosion ripped the number three ship in half, maximum effort has been exerted toward getting another engine and installing it in ship two. Months of work, weeks of painstaking trials, round-the-clock days of final pre-flight were at last put to the test on the morning of November the 15th. This is the X-15 in its final stage of development. This run, if successful, will mark the beginning of a whole new era of flight research. It's okay down here, Scott. We'll clear to go. Right. Roger. 25. Tom Pilot. Atlanta Cooling going down. Got it. Launch. With the new engine loafing at idle, the plane could go to four times the speed of sound. So the speed brakes are open to stay close to Mach 2. It's good, Scott. Let it ride, of course. You're okay. Fire on ready, Ralph. Scott, could you tell us in your own words how the flight went and what you thought of it? Very well, and the engine and its power is impressive. What was your maximum altitude and speed? Did you have a chance to check that yourself? Yeah, I got <clears throat> about 80,000 feet and a Mach number approaching three. Scott, your, your radio talk sounded a bit hesitant this morning before takeoff. What was that about? 
Oh, no, I think you misinterpreted that. Of course, we've been doing the best we can to get this flight off for five years. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> There's any hesitancy there. Scott, <clears throat> having observed the uh, minimum thrust performance of the engine, do you think that the uh, airplane now will be able to live up to its design promises of all the tube and speed, or will exceed it, or what do you feel? Yeah, really, without question, I got a little faster today than we'd planned, and we have on our previous flights, and my flight's gotten faster than we planned, because for uh, once in history, we've underest overestimated the drag on the airplane. I think it'll exceed its original expectations. Just seven days later, the second flight was launched, and on the 6th of December, the third. Both showed the engine to have all the abilities claimed of it. These two eminently successful flights closed the year. But the story of the X-15 stands not in the past, but in the future, when every flight is a record breaker, when every trip away from the B-52 is an unparalleled research mission. Human hands will be learning a new skill to thrust deep into unexplored areas, capture vital information, then settle to a safe return from that twilight land standing between Earth and space. Hey, 